people well it's just humans isn't it that we get into that um we prefer doing a certain thing and then we just get focused on it well the trouble is it really depends on where you're up to where the landscape's up to at the time as to whether it's actually capable of doing that mm. plants built this what we see not yeah. animals animals came after plants yeah never the other way around and so thinking that you're going to build it and then you go into the plant kingdom grasses are at the end of the succession mm. not the beginning so if your landscape's at the beginning or close to the beginning you ain't starting with grass right. therefore you're not starting with animals either yeah so it's fraught with danger because it will only take you so far till the system collapses again if you don't understand that it's very important to understand that all plants are part of the system not grasses and too much language is about grasses grasses whether it be perennials or annual annuals because of course that's what a grazier wants yeah for their business but it won't sustain it mm. can't all of our landscapes were built by plants prior grasses then came grasses were able to balance it and manage that system but if the system's already down it can't bring it back up mm. it requires other plants to do that it's complex isn't it no it's not really it's not it's not complex we make it complex we don't need to you know it's it's actually quite simple the simple part is that we need all plants in the system and whatever we do we need to be encouraging all plants to grow and nature is the best judge we can manipulate it however we like we can mani manipulate it with machinery with chemicals with animals we manipulate it to grow the plants that we want mm. but it may not necessarily be the ones that nature wants yeah therefore the system will crash yeah. inevitably we've got to go back to understand well okay where did it start the earth started as a rock a solid rock from there it was broken down over a long long period of time and plants built the soil that we have today plants other than grass mm. built the soil that we have today grass came as a result of the fertility built by those plants before so unless we understand that we're still going to be in no man's land yep. Stuart Andrews everybody in the back of the ute uh, we're on Forage Farm and I thought that we could have a, a bit of a discussion about regenerative farming um, and about education as well and bringing in the consumer into the farming side of things and how important it is obviously because food is what's made on farms Indeed it is. Thanks for sitting in the back of the ute with me. Thank you for having me, Tamsin. <laughs> Glad to be here. So, um, yeah, where do we start? So, shall we start on farm? Sure. Okay. So, you, we were just in a bit of a discussion then about um, what comes first, whether it's the weeds or the grass. Um, so, uh, when we are talking about farming, it's actually really quite important that we make sure we're not trying to fight with nature or fight with the, the situation that we've got. So how do we as humans make that easier for ourselves? Well, we get out our, our ability to observe, which we do have. Unfortunately, we tend to switch it off and we tend not to observe and we tend to want to control rather than manage. So the moment we switch from being control to manage and observation, we can then look and see what nature is telling us because all the stories are there, everything, every story we need to know, particularly in this landscape, the Australian landscape, every story we need to know of what we need to do to rebuild the system is all there because it's done it before, time and time again. This landscape is the oldest and flattest continent, driest continent on the earth. So it has all of the stories of how it managed to rebuild itself from desertification. So all the stories are there, so we know how to do it. All we've got to do is spend the time to look. Yeah. And some people find this easier than others. Oh, I'm sure they do. I mean, the, the, the challenge, I don't think it's difficult. The challenge is fitting a production system in there at the same time. So, you know, every farmer that I know of is trying to make a living. Yeah. So they have to have some form of productivity at the same time. So if they're trying to create productivity, how do they rebuild the landscape and get something productive off of their land at the same time. And you can do that, but you first of all must understand how the landscape did it prior to humans being here. Mm. And that's all humans, both Aborigines and Whitefella. Mm. And so would you class um, the water side of things as your first priority? Well, I tell you what, I'll ask you, 
How do you go when you don't get to drink water? <laughs> Not very well. How do the plants go when they don't get to drink water? Fall over. Yeah. So really, where do you think we should start? <laughs> Water. Water. And and there's not only that the plants and, and animals and humans require the water, the landscape requires water to moderate the temperature. Mm. We hear a lot of talk about temperature these days and global warming and all that sort of stuff. But it's the water. It's that water that, that manages the heat to keep things cool or allows it to heat up. So water is most important. The other part is that water, as in rainfall when it comes, tends to carry away our environmental capital. Our environmental capital being the fertility we need to grow our plants. So every time it rains, when water is not managed, managed, not controlled, when water is not managed, it is carrying away our environmental capital. Therefore, it's diminishing the ability of our landscape to build. So if we manage water, and it was once done very well by plants, but the moment we set about our farming practices, whether it be with animals, mismanaged animals probably more so, or cropping systems, the water is no longer being managed by plants. Therefore, the water is now under the power of gravity, carrying everything off your farm. Now, it will always rain. How it rains, that's all we can, that's all we can sort of deal with. If we can keep our landscape cool, then we have a, an ability to manage how and when the rainfall comes. But the moment we don't manage any of that and you get the, all of these heat fluxes, then we get violent storms. Therefore, our rainfall comes in much larger doses and then does more damage. So it carries away the fertility. Worst case scenario, carries away our soil. And it's been doing that for the last 230 years in Australia and longer in other countries. Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned that about gravity because when I heard you do the presentation a few weeks ago, you mentioned gravity and then one of your questions was, which way does salt move? And I hadn't even thought about it because I was immediately going to say up. <laughs> yeah, and look, you know, most of us of our vintage were, were taught that. We were taught that salt rises. Um, the interesting thing when I ask that question these days, the majority of people actually say it moves laterally. I don't know that they really know why. Um, maybe they've heard that, that's, they've heard that response before because we've been banging around about this for quite some time. Maybe they've heard that. I don't know. But at least they're saying that rather than saying that salt rises against gravity. Yeah. Haven't never seen that being able to happen yet. Haven't seen anything being able to beat gravity. So except for plants, they can. So when you showed us that picture and you had at the base of, of the, let's just call it a mountain or a hill, um, there was a lot of salt down there. And so what was actually happening there? Well, the fertility was leaking out of the higher part of the landscape and going to the lowest part of the landscape under gravity with water as the vehicle. And so why was the salt higher down there? It was fertility. We just call it salt. But that salt could be calcium salt, um, magnesium salt, potassium salts. That's fertility. That's what grows the plants. It's just that it's moving out. Then you've got salts that come from the ocean in rainfall, 60 parts per million of salt in every rain event been falling on this landscape for millions of years. So there's a buildup of that salt sitting in our clay layers, held there comfortably, not causing any problems until we disrupt the system. And we start mobilizing that salt through not managing plants because the plants are then the plants would manage the water and only the excess water runs off after the, the soil profile is full filled. But if we overwet the landscape, then we start mobilizing the salts which are tucked away comfortably in the clay layer. Okay. But our, un, our misunderstanding of our landscape of, are forcing and pushing that overwetting the landscape, which is then mobilizing the salts. So the salts will always express, express themselves at the lowest point. Mm. And in that case, that shot that you're thinking about was, it would have been a, a lake, but the lake's dried up and it was what would have been fresh once, and now it's salty. And then the fresh water pushes the salt down? Only if you get fresh water back on top, but that doesn't happen unless you intervene, because the fresh water can only be perched f from somewhere above. Just sitting the fresh water over the top won't cut the mustard, because you've got to have the water moving through. And that's to do with your water table level, and then you create that by these contours that you manually put in higher up? Well. What you do is you are hydrating the landscape, even if it's only just the surface area, you're hydrating that area with fresh water. The moment you put fresh water over the top of salt, the salt can't move. 
because it's held there by the fresh water. And then plants manage that by drawing it up. So if you've got an area like that one where that area was, there was a lot of salt build up, you contour that system so that you get the fresh water in the top part of the soil and that puts pressure down on the salt and gives the plants a little zone where they can grow where they haven't got their roots in the salt. Then they use the fresh water to survive and they tap into the extra facility, which are the salts, down the bottom and only take what they need. So they can live in the, in the layer you, cr you create in the surface, which is what we, well, how this landscape used to work. And the problem is that we keep wanting to grow, have plants that feed deeper and deeper, yet all of our fertility was held in the surface. All of our water was held in the surface. Obviously we had water down deeper, but there was the top area was always wet. It was always high carbon rich soil and it could grow any sort of plant you like because the fertility was there and the salt was managed by the plants. And, and that everything. has to do with the carbon being there too. Of course. Well you need carbon to you need something for the water to hold on to, to bind to. So you get clays that can hold water, otherwise you need carbon. If you've got sand, I think everybody knows that if you get a bucket of sand and pour water on it, water goes through it. Yeah. If you get carbon or even organic matter and mix in with that sand, it now holds water. It's really not rocket science. We don't, we don't need to over-confuse this and try to make it sound scientific just so it sounds good. <laughs> it's much easier if we keep it very simple, understand the simple parts and just do that. We grow plants, we've got roots in the ground, we've got fertility, we've got, as long as we've got plants in there that are not able to be eaten by animals as part of the mix, then that plant is returning all of the fertility it takes to grow that particular plant back to the surface. Where are we now putting our fertility? On the surface. Mm. Now, think about this, if we're using animals to manage our plants, which is exactly what we need to do. But the animal turns the plant into what? Shit. Yep, that's a good thing. But if the manure is not managed, say by dung beetles and buried into the soil, what can happen to it? it? Just slips on the top. No, go back to the first thing we started with. What's the stuff that falls out of the sky? Rain. Yeah, what happens when rain comes in large dumps? Washes it away. Washes all the shit away. So all the fertility that grew, took to grow that plant, which the animal consumed, used a, t used a tiny amount of that fertility to grow muscle and bone, the rest of it came out its back end and you just washed it away. Mm. See how your system crashes? Yep. And that's what's been going on for 230 years, mm. that sort of system. So we must have these other plants that have the ability to go down deeper and they can capture some of that fertility that has been leached through the profile of the soil, not the stuff that's run off, that's now in the ocean, feeding the fish mm. or the plankton and the life in the ocean. But we've still got a load of fertility down deeper, but we need the plants that are inedible to source that, not the plants that are edible or the same process starts again. <laughs> so all we do is have these plants that can mine from fertility from deeper down but still be consumed. Therefore, what is the most important part about that system? The human. Because it's the human that determines how much of that plant gets eaten and how much doesn't. Do you know how much faith I have in humans? Zero. Absolutely none. So because unfortunately a lot of people allow other things to get in their way. Usually it's something to do with money. But surely the people that you've educated, Stuart, surely you'd have more than 0% faith in them. Gaining. <laughs> we, we, we've only had, the, we've only had the, uh, uh, the luxury of being able to educate a few people at the moment, but we, it is gaining. So yeah, look, I mean, there's a lot of people out there doing some really good things and educating people. It's not just us. There's a lot of people teaching teaching guys how or ladies how to manage their livestock better and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff going on out there, but it's still only a small percentage. We really need to change it. We need to we need to scale that up considerably before we're going to see the changes that we need. So moving on to the educational side, um, uh, we've had this conversation a little bit as well, we've touched on it with regards to the consumers being educated as well, because I know you're pretty passionate, same as me, about that. Um, explain, you have on-farm visits, do you? Yep, yeah, we do farm tours here. You're right, look, if, if the, the real, the people with all the power to create change in the world, not just Australia, in the world are the consumers. Yeah. They're the ones that actually create 
bad or good, and it's done by the way they spend their money. So you choose to spend your money on cheap food, then the farmer that produced it had to produce it very cheaply and someone has to lose. So either the farmer loses, doesn't make enough money, or the land does. There's no one, there's no way of making food cheap without something losing, yeah. right? So there has to, food has to be a fair price and you have to be prepared to pay it if you wanna see all of these beneficial changes. If you wanna see farmers looking after the land because the, what they can do in looking after the land, they can change the climate. Yeah. So they can stabilize the climate, which guess what? Affects the consumer. Mm. So, and the consumers are, quite often you see farmers getting blamed by consumers for destroying the landscape. Yeah. And look, sometimes that's fair. Sometimes that's a fair call, but at the same time, the consumers clear trees, vegetation, along, mostly along the um, coastlines of Australia to live and turn it into concrete. So they are just as guilty. There is not one person living in this world that is guilt free. And, and it's not just a one person solve. This is for everyone to do, but the consumer has all the power because they vote the people in that's supposed to run the country, and that's another story, we won't get into that. <laughs> but they also determine how farmers farm. So if the consumer decides that they want farmers to be able to fix the landscape, which they are more than capable of doing, with the right education and the right support, and most importantly, the right amount of money to be earned to be able to do it. Because yeah. to farm in a way that builds landscapes actually creates jobs. Yeah. It creates jobs, which means that people that currently don't have jobs or don't like working in their job because they'd rather be out in the land, but there aren't enough jobs there for them to work, yeah. then you create this whole community of people out doing good things. And, you know, for a very small amount of increase in price, mm. it doesn't have to be exceptional, but, you know, we need people to start to think very carefully about how they spend their dollars. So, you know, you know that's, what, that's what we're about. So our farm here, Forage Farms, is about producing food that we sell directly to the consumer. We have farm tours, so we bring people on to educate them about exactly this, about how they spend their dollars is vital. Then they can talk to their friends to, you know, maybe influence them in how they spend their dollar. And that then, the bigger picture is that they are going to influence farmers to farm the way that we want them to farm. And I'm sure they want to farm that way too. They just don't, yeah. they just can't. Yeah. You know, they're stuck in a position where you know, they've got a huge amount of debt or at least they've got debt that they've got to pay off. And so they've just got to do what they can to, to make a dollar. Yeah. There are a lot of ways, and that's where our training comes in, there are a lot of ways that you can minimize the losses off of your landscape to make you more productive. The less you lose, the more you make. So, you know, that then makes them profitable in that they, ha they can stop spending so much. So all of, these, all of the money that people spend, you know, adding fertilizer or chemicals or whatever, just trying to get plants to grow or kill, whichever the case might, may be, you know, they can do that completely differently by managing their losses. Manage the loss of water, manage the loss of fertility, increase the green surface area, which means you capture more sunlight, more carbon, put it in the soil where it's safe and stable, and guess what? More carbon, more water grows more plants, makes them more productive, therefore makes more money. It's a win-win. So, you know, it's only in that interim period probably that even the food prices have to go up. Yeah. They probably don't need to stay up. Yeah. It's just the interim. Once you start to get a lot of people doing this, then all of those excess, all the problems that farmers have to face disappear, therefore it's cheaper to produce food. Yeah. It's once again, you know, it's not rocket science. It's really, really simple. And if we just look at the simple stuff, things that we can do, and if you're interested in digging into the detail, by, by all means, but don't let it consume you. Because people all the time get consumed by complexity and do nothing. Yeah. Because it gets so scary to know, oh, what do I do? Because all this, that, no, no. Just keep to the simple stuff. Yep. Thanks, Stuart. No worries, Tamsin. Great conversation in the back of my ute. <laughs> no worries, thank you for having me. In the back of your ute. <laughs>
Thank you, that was great. <laughs> no problem. You only have to ask me the right questions and I'll answer them. <laughs> I know, you're good. And then you were like, I was, I was, I was ready for another question. I, went, I don't need it. That was 20 odd minutes, I think. There you go, you should have plenty of footage. Yep. Very good.